it's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. Good afternoon, I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and today we have a fascinating program. This is all about space weathering, so joining me today is Laura Corey, who is a NASA Graduate Research Fellow at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and her advisor, Jeff Gillis-Davis, who's an associate researcher, also at HIGP at Manoa. And so let's get started. Um, today's topic is space weathering, and I'm particularly interested, Laura, so I've heard of space weather, and that, I believe, is what produces the northern lights. Absolutely. But what is space weathering? What's the difference? So the difference is that um, space weather is how uh, the particles from the sun interact with our uh, magnetic field and also the um, atmosphere, which is what produces the northern lights. Yeah. Um, whereas space weathering is actually the geologic process that occurs when planetary bodies do not have an atmosphere or magnetic field. So these are things like uh, the solar wind, which are hydrogen and helium atoms that impact the surface, and also micrometeorites, or dust-sized particles, oh, that can right. impact the surface of planetary And bodies. we have a nice cartoon, the first image, I we think, do. shows the, the sun. And if we could have the first slide, yes, here we go. Um, so on our left, we've got a cartoon of the sun and lots of things streaming out from the sun. And then we've got the Earth on the right, so. Right, so the Earth has, you can see the blue um, lines are the magnetic field lines, and that shields the Earth from these hydrogen and helium particles. Um, but the moon does not have um, an atmosphere or a magnetic field to protect it from these particles. And the moon's so far away from the Earth that Earth's magnetic field does not protect the moon. Correct. And then, Jeff, um, so space weathering would perhaps be the long-term effects of this solar wind, say, measured over geologic timescales. Is that correct? That's correct. So this process of micrometeorites, as Laura said, and uh, so, uh, hydrogen and helium hitting the surface of the moon or mercury or asteroids that are out there in space actually change the surface properties of those objects. And that's something Laura is studying. She's studying you know, what happens, what are the effects, and how we can detect it. But hydrogen and helium, they're, they're really light. They don't weigh very much. Atoms, right? They must be going very fast to do any damage to rocks or to any other geological materials. Right, so the solar wind is, you know, flying by us at about 700 kilometers per second. So, when so that's 500 miles a second. About, yeah, about 500 miles per second. So it's streaming by, and when it hits, it gets implanted and actually causes damage to the crystal structure of the minerals on the surface of these airless bodies. And the effect is to make it a glassy, amorphous surface and also to change the chemistry. And, right. and amorphous for our viewers means that it doesn't have any structure. It, yeah, glass. so you can think of it as a, as a glass. It's a glass. And this, yeah. you know, rim thickness is only, you know, 100 nanometers, so, you know, it's extremely... Narrower than your human hair. By a lot, yeah. By a lot. By a lot, yeah. So, um, what Laura wants to do is study how the process of, um, happens at the poles of the moon, because uh, the temperature at the equator is higher than the temperature at the poles. And what that means is the, the, the minerals being cooler might not um, change as much as the minerals at the okay. equator. So, but just to back up, it's these hydrogen and helium atoms zipping along at mm -hmm. 500 miles a second, yep. hitting an object, and the key thing is that the moon, or presumably something like an asteroid or Mercury, because it lacks an atmosphere, mm -hmm. Or and it lacks field. a magnetic field. So we don't have to worry about this kind of space weathering. This geology doesn't happen on Earth, right? Correct, uh, or on Mars or Venus, presumably. It also happens on Mercury and asteroids as well as the Moon. Okay. And I'll ask you later on, is it the same rate? Is it uniform? Right. But you, you brought along, a, a, in the second image, Laura, I think we can see exactly what the, quote, impact is of some of these uh, little projectiles. Right. So what do we have here? Well, well, process number one was the solar wind, 
But process number two of space weathering is micrometeorites. So we all know what meteorites are that fall on Earth um, from the leftover material as the solar system formed. Um, well, actually, there's dust-sized meteorites that can also fall, and they will create these little craters that we see in our image on the surface of the rock. And the little craters are those sort of white dots with a yep, black. Yeah, circular, oh. whitish areas. So the black is a glassy impact melt that splashed over this rock, which was collected at Apollo 16. And then these little dust-sized grains were hitting the moon at 20 kilometers per second, or you know, about 15 miles per second, and they make these little impact craters. And you're studying the geological effect of all these little holes forming over millions or perhaps even billions of years, is that correct? Correct. These little holes as well as the melt and vapor that's deposited from the impact. Why do we want to know that? Um, well, we want to know this because as that surface changes, it can change the um, reflectance of the material. And the reflectance of a planetary body is one way that we tell what the composition is. So we need to understand the space weathering process in order to know uh, the starting composition of a planetary body and how that composition has evolved over time. I see. And does this actually give you a clock in a sense that if you know the rate at which these atoms are streaming out of the sun and they're hitting a surface, presumably if there are more holes on the rocks, then it's an older surface. Correct. So you can um, do things like count the density of the solar flare tracks on the rock mm -hmm. to understand how much um, time it has been exposed to the space environment. Right. And you're studying predominantly space weathering on the moon. Correct. Um, we could look at Mercury, and I'll ask Jeff about that in a few minutes, but the moon presumably uh, is a really good place to do this investigation simply because we have samples with known ages. We do have samples of known ages, yep. and also um, we currently have a mission orbiting the moon called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So we can look at the um, data from that and understand space weather and, as well. And speaking of missions, Jeff, you were part of the MESSENGER spacecraft, which went into orbit around Mercury in 2010 or whenever it was. Um, do you see the same kind of space weathering on Mercury as Laura is seeing on the moon? Right, we do. Um, the mer Mercury being much closer to the sun is getting blasted by the solar wind at a higher rate. Uh, because it's closer. Uh, it's also at a higher temperature. The surface temperature is about 400 uh, degrees centigrade, so, uh -huh. you know, it's oven temperature, and that also affects the minerals. And then the micrometeorites, uh, because that dust is falling into the sun, it's actually picking up speed. So by the time it gets to mercury, it's now traveling, you know, 40 or 50 kilometers per second or 30 to 40 miles per hour per second. And it's doing even more damage because it's you know mostly kinetic energy that causes the damage. Okay, I, I'm presumably some of our viewers know that say Mercury always has one side facing the sun, which means it would get blasted by solar flares. But the far side of Mercury, which never sees the sun, is that exclusively micrometeorite bombardment? Uh, it do, it's not um, synchronously locked like the moon. Uh, it does actually rotate with two to three spin orbit rotation. So it does have poles that, uh, what we call the hot poles. So those are pointed at the sun at its uh, uh, perihelion point, and then the other parts are um, pointed at the aphelion point, so they're a little bit cooler. But that does, interestingly enough, actually help migrate different elements around, some more volatile elements. So you can't do a compare mm -hmm. and contrast between Mercury and the Moon and say, ah, this must be solar weathering, this must be micrometeorite bombardment? Um, no, not that way. Uh, the Mercury does have a small magnetic field that does potentially hold off some of the solar wind, but it's you know not enough to really make that much of a difference. But it does have some interesting features. The magnetic field lines go into the poles of Mercury, so it actually concentrates some of the solar wind, those hydrogen ions coming in, and it could uh, actually create more damage at the poles than at the equator versus wow. the Moon without the magnetic field. It's, it's, it's mostly the equator. It's more complicated. It's a bit imagine. more complicated. Yeah. yeah, and then there's yeah. the chemistry. You know, Mercury's chemistry is a little bit different. It has more sulfur in it um, and lower iron than the Moon, so that also you know creates some different effects. Right.
let's take another look at a slide, um, because I believe, Laura, you're, you're a NASA fellow, correct? Which correct. means if we can go on to the next slide, what we would likely see. Here we're looking at more of this damage. Now, did you collect this particular image? And it's, the scale is uh, in nanometers, right. right? That's NM. Um, this is actually from a lunar soil drain, correct? That's correct, yep. Um, so this is the actual uh, space weathering process as it occurs on the moon. And um, the substrate there is that glassy rim that Jeff mentioned earlier. And the white circular regions are actually the iron metal that's deposited in blebs as the material is melted and vaporized from space weathering. And any lunar sample that the Apollo astronauts returned would look like this if you did a thin section? Uh, so the lunar soil samples. The lunar have soil this. samples. Yes, not correct. the big rocks or anything? Um, like. Not to this degree. Um, they have a glassy patina, um, but not to this degree. It's not as um, a mature sample that's um, been reworked as much as the soil is. Um, okay. So this is what changes the reflectance of. The material. It so, if darker. you're taking color images or multispectral images mm -hmm. of the moon from orbit, these kind of glassy surfaces would actually change the apparent question. Right. right. So, you get um, a darker um, material and also a redder material, meaning in the longer wavelengths, it's brighter than in the shorter wavelengths mm -hmm. of light. And would you go to Mauna Kea to make these measurements with one of the telescopes, or do you have to have a spacecraft in orbit around the moon to make sufficiently precise measurements? Uh, you can also look at telescopic data okay. as well and get reflectance. Mm. I think we've got time just for one more slide. Uh, and as I was indicating, I think, Laura, you were uh, a NASA fellow, and I believe this is the actual instrument. And in the second half, we'll hear a little bit more about this. Right. But w what is it that we're looking at here? This is the NASA Ames Vertical Gun Range in Mountain View, California. And this is a high-impact gas gun that fires projectiles at about six kilometers per second or 13,000 miles per hour. Okay, and so we use much this faster than solar wind? Um, not no? much faster, but um, at a comparable speed to what micrometeorites hit out on the uh, planetary bodies. And, and, and how big is it? We sort of see at the bottom left, we've got a, a step ladder. So this is quite a big piece of equipment. Yeah, so th if you zoom out, the whole gun actually goes up to the ceiling of this building. So it's about two stories high. And, um, and the Jeff, orange apparatus. And Jeff, this is terrific. But a graduate student at Manoa, you're able to get Laura to get access to this kind of equipment. Is this a, a, a special opportunity, or do other researchers have access to this equipment? All NASA researchers have access to the equipment if they write a proposal to NASA stating what science they're going to get. Uh, from it, it gets peer reviewed, and whether it has a high enough science merit rating, you know, that uh, PI or principal investigator will get funded and can use this apparatus. And, you know, this is one of the great things that we get to use so that we can train the next generation of scientists and how we do our yeah. teaching with hands on science approaches. Yeah. I'm going to ask you in the second segment uh, what you hope to do career wise mm -hmm. with all this skill set. Um, but clearly, th this is a wonderful opportunity, and presumably, that's all part of your NASA fellowship, right? That you know, sort of if you get NASA money to do your PhD, then you can go and use NASA facilities. Yep, as a graduate student, we have those opportunities. Ter terrific. Okay, well, um, we're about to take a break now, so let me just remind all our viewers, uh, you're watching Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and today's guests are Laura Corley, graduate student at the University of Hawaii with her advisor, Jeff Gillis-Davis. And when we come back, we'll hear a bit more about some of your experiments, Laura. So we'll be right back, so don't go away. A veteran, my victory was finding the strength to be a champion. My victory is having a job I can be proud of. At DAV, we help veterans get the benefits they've earned. My victory was finishing my education. My victory was getting help to put our lives back together. DAV provides veterans with a lifetime of support. My victory is being there for my family. Help us support more victories for veterans. Go to DAV.org.
And welcome back. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis Mark, and our guest today, our Laura Corley, graduate student at the University of Hawaii, with her advisor, Jeff Gillis Davis, who's an associate researcher also at the University of Hawaii. Now, Laura, we saw that wonderful photograph of the gun at NASA Ames, which is just south of San Francisco. I believe you brought a video which shows what you can do with this piece of equipment. That's so, right. So yeah. we can uh, so take high-speed video um, at the Ames Vertical Gun Range. So we have a video to show of the actual impact. So this okay, is a powdered material. It's powdered minerals. And you can see the ejecta coming out. It actually forms a crater. And that um, small circle there on the surface is a quarter for scale. Uh, I was wondering what the scale yeah. of this is. Mm -hmm. And the projectiles coming in at a couple of kilometers a second, is that what you were saying? Correct, six kilometers per six second. Six kilometers mm -hmm. a second, pretty fast. And we have um, those large particles in that ejecta coming out are actually similar to what's created um, on the moon, and they are called agglutinants. They're um, melty aggregates of the material that was impacted. And the surface of the moon, the rocks there, would have experienced this kind of impact for millions, if not billions of years, if they're really old rocks, is that correct? Correct. So that's what's really doing the damage, and that's what you can detect with some of your spacecraft color data or your multispectral data. That's right, and also in Apollo samples. And, and the Apollo samples, yeah. And these velocities may not sound all that fast, because you can drive, you know, 60 miles an hour, which is actually a lot slower. But, you know, this is actually a lot faster than a bullet, you know, about 10 times faster than the average bullet. If you shot a bullet into this target, it would just make a small hole. What you're seeing is these little particles, which are actually, you know, a fraction of an inch. You know, the original diameter was about eighth of an inch. It gets broken up into fragments that are much smaller than that. And they're doing this damage by actually exploding. They release their energy so quickly. What you're seeing is a little explosion that makes a crater about six or eight inches across and about three inches deep. And, and Jeff, we're seeing video, but this video must be recording at a high frame rate per second, right? Right. Uh, any idea? What I think it's you? about 60,000 frames per 60, second. 60,000 mm -hmm. frames, frames and second. now we're playing it back much slower, so presumably all of this would be over in half a second, if not yeah, right. a fraction. fraction of a second. When so it happens in real life, it, it, you know, you don't even see it. You don't even see you it. You hear it. You hear it. It's yeah, you hear loud. it, but, you know, on the regular screen. And how many of these experiments did you conduct? Um, so we shot, I think, 16 shots with the gun over a five-day period. So you can get, like, five done? Uh, so three done per yeah, day. Yeah, max three, to three per day. It takes that long to set up the equipment and the And you the, the actually fire into a giant uh, vacuum chamber, so um, the air has to be pumped out of the chamber before All of this is fire. done in a vacuum. It's all right. done in a vacuum to simulate the you know, lunar environment. What a wonderful experience that must have been for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you planning to go back? Um, no plans yet. Um, I've switched gears into um, doing the experiments of space weathering using a laser to simulate space weathering. So a pulsed laser is able to melt and vaporize material, much like, like the micrometeorite impacts would on the moon. Hmm. And you can do this at Manoa? Yes, we do that in Jeff's lab at UH Manoa. Wonderful. So Jeff, the laser... Did, I think you brought along some slides of, of the I, equipment. I'm not sure if it's the next image or see. whether it's... We can bring that up and um, Laura can speak to it a bit. But, you know, the advantage of doing it in our lab is, you know, we only use about a half gram of material. Controlled experiments. And, well, is, this, is this the equipment? That, yeah, yeah, I that think that slide was the equipment, yes. So you can see we're at a much smaller scale. This gold chamber is our vacuum chamber uh, that Laura can cool versus that other huge chamber um, that we used at Ames that used about 50 kilograms of sample. So because we okay. use less sample, we can do so space the, weathering the, more so quickly. The, the so the laser is up at the top left, and then where again in the sample, you've got that red it, laser beam. Yep, it hits the mirror, the, and the yeah. sample is sitting in that gold chamber. In the thermal inside, chamber. Right. So you do controlled experiments, changing the temperature 
That's right. We can um, use liquid nitrogen to cool that chamber so that temperatures get down to about um, 80 Kelvin, which is around negative 300 Fahrenheit. And you can do this in a vacuum as well? Yes. It has to be done in a vacuum for the cold temperatures. Very good. Amazing piece of equipment. I believe, Jeff, you put this all together, didn't you? It's part of a NASA project? Yeah, it was part of a, another uh, grant that we had, and Laura and I put it together, you know, some trial and error. We had the chamber from um, earlier experiments that we kind of retrofit a little bit to the purposes of trying to understand what happens if the same material is at a lunar pole or, you know, basically a colder temperature. Does it respond similarly to material at the equator? So temperature variations, even if it's way below freezing of water, the temperature variations across the moon really do have a, uh, an influence on the type of chemistry you would expect or the, the, the glass content, is it? Yeah, well, we believe the low temperatures kind of um, reduce the amount of space weathering that occurs. We might get less melting and vaporization at low temperatures compared to at warm temperatures. Um, so the material isn't maturing as fast. So you're looking for spatial variations across the moon from the equator to the two poles, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And actually, we see with the uh, Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter, um, it measures increased brightness with colder temperatures. Right. And one thing that's um, causing that is the presence of surface frost in the um, polar regions, but also as you move towards the poles, there's a trend that um, likely indicates reduced space weathering. And, and you've got another image from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, I think it's two Yeah, we have some globes. Two, two globes, which you can show us coming up on the screen. Here we go. And, and so we're seeing uh, Diviner is the instrument, is that correct? Yes, Diviner. Okay. And we're looking at left hand side is daytime and nighttime is on the right. So they're really very cold, correct? You were looking at. Right. So the temperature range, you know, at the equator is around a uh, max of 300 Kelvin during the day, or 300 Fahrenheit during the day to negative 300 Fahrenheit at night. Um, so that sees the biggest temperature swing, but if you look at um, the polar regions, um, they are much colder in general. So they get actually as low as about negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow, quite a difference. And, and the stripy nature of these images are presumably the orbital tracks of the, the spacecraft or how right. you process the, the data. data. So with the hotter surface temperatures, it's closer to its you know, melting point. So when the impact hits, it can melt and vaporize more material than an impact that hits closer to the pole. And that's what Laura is seeing in her um, data that I think she has some spectra that she can show. Yes, the next slide should show, I think, what, what effect you're actually talking about. Is this right? Okay. The, the brightness is uh, Yeah, so the this is the data from the um, lunar orbiter um, laser altimeter that shows, you know, this increase in reflectance at 110 Kelvin is likely ice. But at the higher temperatures, we're still seeing this trend that needs to be explained. So it's probably reduced space weathering causing the bright brighter areas. And for our viewers, room temperature is about 290 Kelvin? Uh, yep, like, 290. Like that. Yep. So um, it expands the range almost from absolute zero to room temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. Um, I think we've got one other slide which will show us some other uh, aspect of your, your work. And this is, I believe, where you're seeing this um, change in temperature, is that correct? So these right. are this is spectra? Yes, these are reflectance spectra of my data, of the um, material that we um, shot with the laser. So the blue line is the cold experiment, and you can see it's brighter than the orange line, which is the room temperature experiment. Um, so this indicates that space weathering at the negative, negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit results in a brighter material compared to room temperature. Okay. Well, we're getting towards the end of the show, Laura, but I have to ask you, what do you hope to do with all this skill? You've been and worked with both the NASA Ames gun and you're firing lasers uh, at, <laughs> in your lab or in Jeff's lab. Where might this take you as a graduate student once you get your degree? 
Um, so I'd like to continue on um, in the same type of research, um, but I'm interested in the OSIRIS-REx mission that NASA is sending to an asteroid. I'd like to work on data from that mission and also potentially the samples returned. Um, so in the future, we can use um, special electron microscopy to look at samples returned from an asteroid and um, look for evidence of space weathering as well on asteroids. Yeah, because we haven't thought about asteroids that much today, but presumably this happens on asteroids as well as the moon and Mercury. Right, right. it does happen on asteroids. Um, we know that from looking at the telescopic data. Mm -hmm. um, but it's likely to happen at a slower rate on asteroids because micrometeorites impacting asteroids which are farther away from the sun are at a lower velocity. So I understand OSIRIS-REx is already en route to the asteroid. So you have a career path, right? You have to get your degree and then find some role within this particular mission. Jeff, is this a typical path for graduate students that graduate from Manoa? Yeah, that's what we try to do is, you know, uh, get them plugged into a mission that's happening. Um, it's the best way to get the hands-on experiment experience that they, they need. And it's, you know, one of the most exciting things you can do, second only to going there going yourself. There yourself yes, um, yes. And hopefully like to in, uh, you know, Laura's professional lifetime, if that's something she wants to do, she'll be able to, you know, be an astronaut. And it's really impressive that the university has the resources and the connections with NASA to both give you access to some of the equipment which you've been using, Laura, but also there is a, a clear um, career path, it sounds as if, once you get your degree, which I understand is going to be this in year, spring, next year, yeah. in the spring. Mm -hmm. So you're in the final phase of writing up, I hope. That's right. Is that correct? <laughs> Okay, well this is really great. I'm afraid we've run out of time, so uh, let me just remind the viewers, you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and our guests today have been Laura Corley, a graduate student at the university, and her advisor, Jeff Gillis-Davis, who's a associate researcher. Thank you both, Laura. Thank you for having and me. And thank Thanks, you, Jeff. A really interesting talk, and good luck with your career, Laura. Thank we you. We look forward to bigger and better <laughs> things later. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye.